my notes. Yeah, this is great stuff. Yeah. Uh, that folks, this is Dr. Kat Schreier with uh, Water Citizen Media Foundation, The Water Show. Um, and I'm here with, with Mayor Stephanie Miner from uh, Syracuse, New York. Syracuse, New York. You can see the orange, we all set. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, was part of a fabulous pa panel here at the One Water Summit real, with, uh, with other mayors, mm -hmm. talking about the role of mayors. In fact, I think I saw you at uh, Infrastructure Week you did. Washington, you did. Yeah. 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 I, I noticed your pin says water is sexy. I'm on this mission to make infrastructure sexy. So, uh, it, yep. So I'm a big believer in infrastructure in general and water infrastructure in particular. Because the city of Syracuse, we have a 130, 140 year old water system. It's gravity fed. We don't have a filtration plant. Um, it was built with uh, manual labor and mules. It is the cleanest, purest, best tasting water in the country, bar none. Uh, but our, it's cold in Syracuse, not this time of year, but it does get cold there. And the system is old and the combination has led to just record water main breaks. And so this has put me on a mission to talk about the importance of infrastructure, water main infrastructure. And I was doing this long before Flint, Michigan um, mm -hmm. became an issue. But once Flint, Michigan happened, across the world you started seeing people talking about the importance of water the importance of having predictable clean water uh, something that we as americans take for granted and unfortunately as you heard on the panel today right and you heard from lots of people th that is something that unless we focus on as policymakers and advocates we are not going to be able to continue to assume that we as americans are going to have access to and and you talked about some of the particular challenges that you've seen in Syracuse. Um, well, one of the things is the coordination that you've done in terms of your infrastructure, and making sure what do you call the one dig, one dig, one dig policy. So while I started off doing this about water uh, infrastructure and water mains because we had so many record water main breaks, what we quickly realized is that you know when you look at infrastructure, you need to look at it comprehensively. So in Syracuse. The rule of thumb we have is when we repave, mill and pave a road, it's a million dollars a mile. So you can spend a million dollars for that mile of repaving it, and then the next day or 10 days later have a water main explode under it or a sewer main or a utility and have to cut into that road and you've already done damage. So when you're starting to think about infrastructure, you really need to think about it as a whole comprehensive package. And I talk about dropping down below the road. So thinking about it in terms of water mains, sewers, utilities, broadband, and using the money so that you can have a one dig policy and that by being efficient and extending the life of the roads, the life of the water mains, the life of the sewer mains, uh, all of those kind of things. And, and being able to deal with these sorts of issues in a very cold climate. And, and I grew up in Jersey, I went to school in New Hampshire. I mean, it's, it's uh, you think about well, it worked up in Calgary for God's sake. So I mean, you think about things a little differently. Well, you know, we do. I will tell you that one of the ways we think about it differently, uh, which is you're hearing across the world and at conferences like this, people thinking about drought. But we have no problems with uh, water in the city of Syracuse. We get lots of snow every year. That's clean, fresh water. By the way, it kills all the bugs, so we don't have cockroaches or any issues like that. Um, but what the, the freeze and thaw cycle does is it takes you know, vulnerable infrastructure and expedites its problems with it um, because the joints move and then, so, yep. And so that's why you, you're seeing older cities that are in colder climates start to have these problems before more temperate uh, newer cities do. But that being said, you know, when you have in UCLA, they have a water main break there. Um, and in the city of Syracuse is having water main breaks. You understand that now this is a problem across the country. And you guys have actually done some work with social media to try to highlight these issues as they come up, not just in Syracuse, not just in New York, but, but all over. We have. We have a, a hashtag called Fix Our Pipes. And uh, what we do is when we see water main breaks from across the country, we put those stories on that hashtag. So you can see the videos and you can, and that really starts to resonate. When you see a water main break, you know, blow up a road, or in Syracuse, as I say, when you have a river running down your road in February in Syracuse, you know something is desperately wrong. You see a water main break in Southern California, the UCLA campus, and kids like body surfing uh, on it. Or when you see water main breaks in New York City or Philadelphia or Boston, and you see them explode the road and then go down to the subway system, you really, at first hand, you can see 
the kind of damage that it's doing. Now, you've also talked about some climate effects at a, a very micro scale. You're not coastal, you're not right. you know, the, the drought in the desert, but, but what, what, were, what were some of the things that you dealt with? Well, you know, one of the things that we kind of pride ourselves on in Syracuse is always talking about how, you know, it's very predictable. So, yes, we get lots of snow and yes, it's cold, um, but we don't have hurricanes and we don't have tornadoes and we don't have cockroaches. Um, and so, as you know, as people are talking about climate change, we had sort of this built in sense that it wouldn't impact us because we're not a coastal city. Uh, but what I said was last year, about this time last year in May, actually, uh, I got a call from a woman who lives five minutes away from me talking about um, the fact that it had been raining so hard in her neighborhood that her house was flooding and her uh, mother was on oxygen on the first floor and she couldn't get her mother up to the second floor. And I was stunned because in my neighborhood where I lived, and this is about 10 o'clock at night, it was, was a gentle rain. I couldn't believe that this was happening so close to me. Um, <clears throat> and we were able to, uh, you know, make sure that we the rain stopped and we pumped out the basement and the woman and her mother were safe. The next day we got everybody together and we diagnosed the problem and they said it was like a 120 year level storm. That's why the, you know, the infrastructure was overwhelmed, but you just know, in that one little area, just in that one discreet, and I'm talking about a tiny discreet area. It was, we all kind of chalked it up to, oh, this is a freakish thing. And 10 days later, the exact same thing happened to the exact same neighborhood. Um, and so we're seeing more microbursts, these more freakish weather events. And while we as a country have not invested to maintain or repair our infrastructure, to bring it up to a state of good repair based on standards from 100 years ago, we're now having completely new challenges. So we don't, it's not thinking about a state of good repair from 100 years ago. It's thinking about climate change and resiliency and repairing this infrastructure to be able to deal with those issues. Now, one of the things about the One Water Summit is it's not an industry event, it's not a you know professional event, it's, it really brings together the policymakers, the scientists, the, the nonprofits, the agencies, the, a lot of real mix here. So so with the leading policymakers and the and the professional community, what well, you know, and of course with Clint, that was one of the major issues, mm -hmm. right? It was it was the disconnect between what uh, well, the I will I will say this uh, yeah. right off the bat. I am very biased about Flint because I think what you saw in Flint, what happened there was when you take away people's elected representatives and you put in appointed officials who are focused on just saving money and not accountability to the public, then you see the kind of decision making happen down the line along the steps because nobody was there with the real fundamental purpose of what is in the best interest of the public that I serve? They were thinking about, well, the ultimate best interest is to try to save money so that, you know, we can get the order. Um, so, you know, as more and more municipalities struggle to, because of the kind of financial crisis that we are all under, uh, I think it's important to remember that elected officials who are accountable to voters, who understand voters and think about, I want to make sure that that woman in the house that has the water coming up knows who to call, and most importantly, that who she calls will answer the phone and solve her problem. That's what I, I think, but again, I'm biased, I'm a mayor, you know? And we, we talked about the, the, the role of mayors versus state and federal agencies, um, what, when mayors really are on the front lines. Well, we are, you know, we don't have the luxury like federal officials of just giving a pithy 30 second sound bite and disappearing. You know, when I'm in Syracuse from the second I leave my house in the morning till the second I come back, you know, 12, 14 hours later, for that matter, it's 24 hours because I'm always answering my phone. I'm accountable to those people. They know where to find me. They know when they see me in the grocery store that my number is listed. You know, the woman knew how to call me, knew how to get a hold of me. And, and that sense of accountability drives you to say that no is not an answer or not solving the problem is not acceptable. The first from being accountable for that solution, the easier it is to just kind of say, well, you know, I'll leave it to somebody else. And I think that, that what has happened now is you're seeing that state officials have been able to take a step away from it. But now in light of Flint, state officials are thinking about it. And even in New York, we've had water issues with P 
PFOAs in water in certain neighborhoods. PFOAs. And PFOAs in Hoosick Falls and Peterborough in New York. It's a, it's a chemical okay. that has leached into the water systems and um, is uh, cancer causing and okay. is on the EPA level of toxic substances. And so state officials in New York have started to become involved in this. Um, and now the next level is saying to the federal government, look, this is not something that you can escape. People, I believe deeply that Americans understand that a fundamental function of government is to provide infrastructure that then allows us to build economies, to build societies and communities on top of that. And we're fortunate that 100 years ago, 50 years ago, we had so much investment in infrastructure that we were able to build these incredible economies. Um, and then we stopped doing that. And now, you know, 20 years later, 30 years later, we're starting to see this infrastructure collapse at record levels, and it's going to continue to collapse. Now, we're also seeing opportunities for innovation. We're seeing opportunities for, for the new climate economy and the new circular economy oh, yeah. and using waste resources. And, and uh, what are we seeing coming out of Syracuse as an area that's always had a lot of Innovative stuff. Well, again, starting with the Erie Canal. I mean, that was you know the infrastructure that made the uh, made us able to you know open up the West. But what we're doing in Syracuse is so we are testing sensors that we can put on our water mains that will send that are sending data back to the cloud, and then that data measures sound waves, and it will tell us, geez, you have a small leak in this water main, or geez, you have a big leak that could be catastrophic. It allows us to be predictive. Um, with where we repair it, um, and it also allows us to, to test out strategies. Part of what I talked about this afternoon is there's been a revolution in technology and data that has really gone by governments and infrastructure because we haven't been investing in it. And so we can use this data and technology to really help us become much more efficient and effective. One of the things that I talked about, I read this article that one of the reasons since Flint is having such a hard time figuring out how expensive it's going to be to replace or repair their water mains is they're not sure about their maps. They just don't know that their maps are where the pipes are. With technology, that can be done immediately so that you have a real sense of here's where our infrastructure is, here's where we need to do repairs, and, and here's the system, and here's how long it is. Um, you, don't, you no longer have to send a person you know, with a tape measure to try to figure it out, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And then greater safety for the uh, absolutely for the folks getting out in the field. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for thank the time. Thank you for the opportunity. Reminded. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. Nice seeing and, you. And thanks for being here at One Water Summit, and thanks for being on The Water Show. I'm Dr. Kat Schreier. If you're watching this anywhere other than thewatershow.org, please go over there. You'll be able to see lots of extra uh, conversations and downloads and videos and things related to the One Water Summit and everything that's new and cool and sexy going on in London. Thank you very much.